Bill. We're here to please. Okay, so welcome to Lunch with Books. As you can see, we have our backup sound system going. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Also, I'm afraid I have to ask you to speak loudly. Why am I hearing uh, feedback? Somebody has their sound on. Bill? Is it you? Somebody has their sound on. Hello? We need to get rid of the feedback. And, and while we're doing this, the rest of you, if you wouldn't mind turning off your cell phones, that'd be great. All right. You turn it off? I'm still hearing it. Okay. And you just have to live with it. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, so, as I was saying, we have our backup sound system. I hope you can hear me okay. And uh, the first thing we'd like to do is that, so when I, uh, when we booked this program, that's really driving me crazy. <laughs> Is that the only speaker you have? Yeah. I'm right there. Yeah, just a little bit. Camera? Huh? No, I think it's the camera again. Yeah. No. That uh, okay. So here we go. We are going to. So when we book this uh, program, I had and for a few years wanted to make a, a zombie film. So we did. And a few of the stars are here: Bob Villa Magna, Bridget Major. Uh, is anyone else here from the movie? Yeah, M Michael, right? <laughs> Jamie. I just met him that day. Sorry. Uh, but uh, it all came together. Uh, Don Feenerty and Jared Thompson did the uh, photography. And we, we filmed in about five hours, and some of it's here in the library. And uh, we're going to play it for you now, if I can possibly do that. This takes coordination to that way. Thank you. 
going to introduce our speaker while we adjust that. Yeah, we had a lot of fun making that. And, uh, Huh? I, I hear that, yeah. Check. Okay, before John. So we're having, uh, some people wear costumes, and uh, we're going to vote, and the winner gets a copy of Night of Living Dead, Blu-ray edition. Uh, next week, from every day to the extraordinary Pittsburgh Glass at the Heinz History Center, Ann Matarazzi will be here. She is the director of the Cultural Division, the Chief Historian, and the Director of the Western PA Sports Museum. And on December 2nd, we're starting the new People's University Cold War. Did that work? No. Um, okay. Our speaker today, now that I've used half of her time, <laughs> Allison Petini Davis is the author of Line Study of a Motel Club. She has some copies with her today. Finalist for the Ohio Anna Book Award and the National Jewish Book Award in Poetry. Her work has appeared in Best American Poetry, poets.org, the New Republic and elsewhere. She serves as the Interim Writing Center Coordinator at Bethany College. She's gonna tell us about the Pittsburgh zombie and how all zombies are woke. Allison Petini Davis. Hello everyone, thank you so much for being here. It means a lot, happy Halloween. Um, I don't know how I'm going to follow that video. That was amazing. So thank you again for the amazing intro video. Um, and a lot of what I'm talking today um, about kind of post-industrial zombie aesthetics um, really has a lot to do with that video, right? How that video looks. It looks like how we think about zombie, how zombie movies look. Um, and kind of this whole idea about how a zombie video looks originated in Pittsburgh. So I think about it as kind of a Rust Belt look or a Rust Belt aesthetic. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Louder? Louder, okay. All right. All right, so a big thing I'm talking about today is um, so obviously George Romero's film, Night of the Living Dead, which was filmed just north of Pittsburgh. I'm especially looking at um, how this movie is not only, was not only filmed um, near Pittsburgh, near Pittsburgh um, but it really emphasizes throughout the film this kind of sense of localness. Um, one thing we're going to be talking about a lot is the zombie rescue stations that appear throughout the film on the broadcast. Here's an example of one, if you can see it. Here's the one for Pittsburgh. Um, the rescue station is the Oakland Medical Center. Um, so we'll see a couple of these throughout. We'll watch a quick um, clip from the film as well that's showing some of them. Um, but again, this film is one that constantly highlights um, where it's located. It's not just in the background, but the foreground. Um, so the three things I want to talk about today is zombies as being regional. Um, they're from here, they're local. Um, zombies and the phenomenon that is Pittsburghese, or how kind of the local dialect goes in Pittsburgh. Um, and this argument that zombies have Pittsburgh accents. Um, and also zombies and post-industrial aesthetics. Um, the sense that zombies um, look like us, or look like um, where they are is where we are. Um, there's this certain look to zombie films that um, they captured so well, and we're coming to get you wheeling as well. I was just so... So thrilled to see that. I'm um, really quickly, how many of you have seen Night of the Living Dead? Guess who actually has never seen the whole thing? Me, because I'm too, too afraid, right? I like watched half of it and like can't do it. Um, so I've done a lot of research on the film without actually having seen the whole thing, which is embarrassing. I probably shouldn't admit that. 
Um, really quick, if you haven't seen it or you don't know all the background information, um, let me see if I can make this a bit bigger. Um, so, Night of the Living Dead, um, made in 1968 by George Romero. He went to Carnegie Mellon for film school. Um, before he, it's his first feature film, and he actually started out um, filming commercials in Pittsburgh. Um, he made a lot of Iron City beer commercials, for example. He also filmed shorts for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So he's someone who was engrossed in kind of the Pitt Pittsburgh commercial film scene um, right before making the most famous zombie film of all time. So he went from Mr. Rogers to, to zombies, right? Um, the film itself, Night of the Living Dead, is filmed in Evans City, PA, which again, about 30 miles north of Pittsburgh. Um, premiered on October 1st, 1968 um, in Pittsburgh. So the world premiere of the film occurred in Pittsburgh. It was a very low budget film. They did not think it was going to go well. Um, it ended up, I think, earning 250 times what was made to put into the film back. So it, was a, it ended up being a blockbuster. Um, Most of the zombies in the film are local, and the film is also notorious for not mentioning the word zombie. They call them ghouls throughout the film. Um, so when I'm using the word zombie, um, it's not actually what they would have used in the film. Um, They're what we now know as zombies. So this talk came about in kind of an interesting way. I was doing research on my dissertation, um, which is a poetry dissertation about the Rust Belt. And I was really interested in a couple things, but especially Rust Belt dialect, how some people talk that are from here. Um, and I was also really interested in just the idea of regionalism um, and labor. What does it mean to be um, a working person from this area? Uh, my first book also looks at this. Um, I, my first book looks at um, growing up into intergenerational family businesses. And my current manuscript thinks about a group of girls um, who work in a local Dairy Queen. Um, and kind of get revenge on their boss. And I kept thinking the way they kind of get revenge on their boss is almost um, like how a lot of workers in this area, um, you know, went on strike to protest for better working conditions. Um, so I'm researching kind of like labor strikes and researching Rust Belt dialects. And I come across this article by Hugh S. Mannon um, called Living Dead Spaces, The Desire for the Local in the Films of George Romero. Um, and I'm like, that sounds interesting. Um, it turns out this is an article about how um, zombies kind of metaphorically stand in for working steel work or striking steel workers or striking industrial workers in um, the, in this area and what would become the Rust Belt. Um, and he specifically argues that um, how zombies talk in the film is kind of um, this version of Pittsburghese or local dialect. So he really studies about how Zombies are meta standing for metaphors for, for locals, for people from the Rust Belt. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is kind of working, showing how I tracked my research into writing this poem um, by reviewing his um, phenomenal book chapter, which again is from this book taking place. I was going to ask real quick. The, the zombies got to the computer. Oh, there we go. That's great. <coughs> All right, so again, I want to um, actually start with talking about zombies and regionalism. Real quick, actually, to go to this other slide. You can see here the different locations of the zombie rescue stations in the film. So we're about to watch a clip from the movie um, where they talk about, you know, the zombies are coming. Make sure you um, go to one of these rescue locations so the zombies can't get you. And you'll see on the screen that the locations that flash on the screen are all local locations. Um, so here's Wheeling over here. Here's Pittsburgh. So all these places are named in the film, um, including Youngstown, where, which is where I'm from, 
uh, La Trobe, which is where Manon, the author of the article I'm talking about, is from. Um, so again, the film is very intentionally set in this place. They make sure they really emphasize it. So let's watch this clip. Let's see if we can show this. I'm not sure it doesn't want to pull up here. Hmm. I maybe won't be able to share that. Um, that's okay. It's playing right over here. I'm wondering, oh, it is up back here. Hold on, let me see if I can get this to run with audio. Just gonna skip it for now. Um, anyway, so in this sequence of the film that I wish I could show you real quick, it's, it's kind of playing back here. You can't hear it. Um, but they're essentially watching the news in the film and on the television, all of these different locations pop up about where you can go to hide from the zombies to keep yourself safe. And uh, some of those locations that come up include Youngstown, Sharon, Mercer, Butler, Ford City, Indiana, Blairsville, Latrobe, Greensburg, Beaver Falls, Foxburg, East Brady, Harrisville, Oakland, McKeesport, Newcastle, Clariton, Cannon Cannonsburg, and Connellsville, right? So places we know, places around us. Here's the Youngstown one. Oh. Make sure this is back up there. Sorry. Can you turn this one back on? Turn it off. Is there just a way to get that? it's running on more than one. That's Halloween.
All right, so again, I just uh, mentioned some of the local places that they talk about in the, the newscast. Um, again, this one has, here's the example of Latrobe. Um, they have a county fire hall is where you can hide from uh, zombies in Latrobe. And again, Youngstown, they have Township Munic Municipal Hospital. Um, so again, the film is really emphasizing the localness um, of the area where it's filmed. Um, why did they do this? Um, a couple of different reasons. Um, I think the funniest one is John Russo, one of the screenwriters of the film. Um, they were so worried that the film would be a flop that they thought that if they put the names of local places in the film, that even if um, at the national level the film flopped, local drive-ins would still play it because they would see the name of their town in it. So they did it to kind of like uh, protect their pocketbook, right? Um, and indeed, when the film was showed locally, maybe some of you remember this, uh, people would clap when the name of their town came on the screen. Um, the author, um, Hugh Mannon, of the chapter I uh, did my research on is from Latrobe, and he remembers whenever he saw the Latrobe uh, on the screen being really excited. Um, he also mentions a joke in his article. Um, he was born in like the 80s in Latrobe or the 70s, and um, he jokes about how the maternity ward must have been like a zombie rescue station because he made it through okay in Latrobe. Um, so again, there's this real connection to these local places. Um, Manon also makes a joke in, the, in his article that zombies are really local um, because how do they get around? They walk, right? And they walk really slow, right? So zombies can't get very far from where they're from. They're kind of insistently local by default. They can't get very far. Again, here's the map of the different locations of where you can be rescued by, from zombies. Um, so zombies are from here. They also talk like they're from here. Um, they talk in this, with this Pittsburghese. Who knows what I mean when I say Pittsburghese? What is it? What are the other words? Downtown is the main one, right? Yins. So Pittsburghese, it's a lot of this ah instead of the ow sound. So it's not down, it's down, right? Um, and Manon makes the argument um, that this kind of ah uh, uh, in Pittsburghese kind of sounds like how zombies talk, right? So he argues that zombies speak the purest Pittsburghese, um, that they have a Pittsburghese ac Pittsburgh accent with no other kind of background language um, to mess with it. Um, so, I, and this also, this is called, I'm going to try to pronounce it. Manafthangization is this linguistic um, dialectical move of replacing the ow sound with the ah sound. Um, so not only are the zombies kind of making this ah, ah Pittsburghy sound throughout the film, um, but because so many actors in the film are locals, um, often they will talk with Pittsburgh accents within the film itself. Um, I might not try to show this clip just because I don't want it to get all messed up again. But this time at the end, maybe I will. Um, but the actor who plays uh, Sheriff Conan McKellen in the film, um, George Kasana, is a, was a Claritin steel mill worker when he was um, in the film. And he talks with a very strong Pittsburgh accent in the film. Um, and it's one of the funniest lines in the film, if you've seen the movie, um, where he's talking about the zombies and what it takes to catch the zombies. Um, he's speaking it all in this really thick Pittsburgh accent. So again, locating the movie in a, in a place, in a dialectical place. Um, Again, Manon argues in his article, what is regional dialect if not an undead quality in language? I want to read the ever-present moaning of Ramiro zombies as undiluted Pittsburghese itself. What we hear in such utterances is manafthangization in its purest form. Um, so another, in addition to this dialectical move, I was really interested in Manning's article because of its connection with zombies to labor strikes, which is something I do a lot of my research in. Um, in a footnote to this article, he talks about his father, who worked at the Latrobe uh, die casting company, and um, remembers, um, I think he remembers being in a car and striking workers surrounding his car. And the author of this article remembers when his father described um, what it was like to be kind of in a car with striking workers kind of converging on you. It almost felt like kind of a zombie invasion, right? Everything was coming closer and closer and he was getting more and more afraid. 
Um, so we thought about this kind of set of, maybe in one way, these zombies, especially because it was filmed in Pittsburgh, the zombies kind of stand in for um, this kind of industrial, the sets, um, the sets of, um, especially if you think about, you know, people in different industries losing their jobs, um, the sets of, the, the undead sets of these industries um, are dying, but they won't truly go away. Um, people want their jobs back, the region, Kind of refuses to die we all keep on going um and the zombie is kind of personifying that in a meaningful way um, i'm going to read a quick quote from um manon's chapter with the decline of big steel and the resultant transformation of boom towns into dilapidated zomboid cityscapes such as braddock aliquippa homestead and many others the zombies depurposed aimless persistence had a special resonance, resonance in 1970s Pittsburgh. Indeed, the sieges and night of the living dead and dawn resembled nothing so much as a union strike turned violent, a fairly regular occurrence in southwestern Pennsylvania in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so again, if you think about zombies as striking steelworkers, for example, it also makes us think about the ways in which um, these zombies, which some viewers might kind of locate in the film as terrifying or undesirable or um, the enemy, we might kind of identify with them as, you know, locals. They're from here. They're people we know who, you know, just no matter what, um, will not will not stop. Um, just as zombies keep constantly plotting forward, they're very resilient. Um, even if we saw, as we saw in the video, the, they're coming to get you really. If they get their balloon stuck in the door, they're going to find a way in. It might take them a while. Um, but they don't stop. So again, these kind of local traits um, of even if you know the industries are you know in decline, um, people don't give up on these places. Um, they keep going. They keep plodding forward, um, kind of like the zombies in the movie. Um, so Manning goes on to say, we might say that the zomboid corpus or the zombie body, like the soon-to-be post-industrial Pittsburgh cityscape of the 1960s and 1970s, is dilapidated. And these local places doggedly persist, albeit in a partially degraded, zombified form. Um, so again, also something in the movie, these zombies refuse to leave their bodies, right? Um, once they're infected by another zombie, they are still like themselves, but they're the zombie form of themselves, right? The undead form of themselves. Um, so in a sense, you could think of places like Wheeling as kind of like these zombie, town, zombie towns, right? It's not um, the Wheeling of the past, but it's still a version of Wheeling. Um, that will that keeps continuing um, persistently, right? No matter what, no matter what it faces. Um, so these zombie bodies, you know, they might kind of look like a dilapidated version of what the person looked like before, um, but they're still very determined to continue. So in that sense, there's kind of this um, metaphor between what zombies look like and what some of our post-industrial cities um, look like. Um, George Romero himself, you know, the director of Night of the Living Dead, when he was shooting another horror film called Martin in Braddock, PA in 1977, um, he kind of describes what was going on around in Braddock, PA as this. Guys were still sitting in the taverns waiting for the mills to open again, you know? It was like, it's going to come back. It's going to come back. Up and down the rivers, all around the berg, it was the American dream, and all of a sudden, where'd it go? Um, and then Manning continues kind of on this thought that Ramiro had. Understood on this local level, Romero's zombies embody the look of industrial decay in their plodding, nearly blind search for somewhere new to resume living. Romero himself is, of course, a post-industrial maverick, making his living as a filmmaker in the Steel City, and as such, his zombies, with their dilapidated appearance, serve as a tidy allegory about the impossibility of ever moving on. The largely unmodified settings of Ramiro's films both present and reflect on the local as a decomposed, disgusting stain. A stain, that is, unless the audience qualifies as local, in which case the uncanny stain comes into focus as something more like home. Um, I really love this quote, um, and this quote is one I used in my dissertation. Um, when I was thinking about what does it mean to make post-industrial art? What does it mean to write a post-industrial poem? Um, what does it mean to make a living or in a life and a family in a post-industrial space? Um, 
I thought about this a lot as someone who grew up in Youngstown. You know, my parents grew up in Youngstown. Their parents grew up in Youngstown. I think I have one great great grandfather um, grew up in Youngstown. And the sense of um, even though it's changed so much over the years, we all just keep going, right? Um, and even when things are difficult, people keep going. Um, and so thinking about you know when people from the coast are thinking about other art movements in my field, thinking about how they think about where I'm from is sometimes as, you know, oh, Youngstown doesn't have the same art scene as like New York City or something. Um, but then, you know, Youngstown doesn't want to have New York City's art scene. Youngstown wants to have its own art scene, you know, as does Wheeling, as does Pittsburgh. Um, we have our own sets of aesthetics. We have our own sets of um, how things look, how things sound, um, what our history is. And in his chapter, Manning really argues that George Romero in Night of the Living Dead and his creation of this Pittsburgh zombie um, really created this kind of, you know, innovative artistic masterpiece of kind of post-industrial creativity in this kind of dilapidated form that won't stop. Um, and if you look also, if you've seen the film, um, I drove in here from Bethany, right, to come from work to come here. It looks like the beginning of Night of the Living Dead, right? It looks like it's kind of rainy and dreary and the roads are like that, down 88. Um, so, you know, it's like I see that film and I don't think, wow, this looks terrifying. I think, oh, that looks like my commute, right? Um, that looks like where I'm from. Um, so this sets of based on who the audience is watching this film are going to have different reactions to the sets of this post-industrial setting and culture. As I mentioned, um, when this film came out, people from Pittsburgh obviously thought it was awesome, right? A lot of them were in it. They were zombie extras. It's like some of you um, in this room were zombie ex in the zombie film um, that we filmed in, in Wheeling, right? Um, but in New York, um, when Night of the Living Dead came out, people were not having it. Um, so the review in the New York Times in 1968 is hilarious. Um, and while the review, which I'm about to read, is actually putting down the film, um, it actually perfectly describes what becomes both post-industrial aesthetics, but also kind of the aesthetics of all kind of zombie films moving forward. So this, um, again, is a review. It's just three, three sentences long by Vincent Candy in the New York Times in 1968. Night of the Living Dead is a grainy little movie acted by what appear to be non-professional actors who are besieged in a farmhouse by some other non-professional actors who stagger around, stiff-legged, pretending to be flesh-eating ghouls. The dialogue and background music sound hollow, as if they have been recorded in an empty swimming pool. And the wobbly camera seems to have a fetishist interest in hands, clutched, wrung, scratched, severed, and finally, in the ultimate assumption, eaten like pizza, um, which right, also goes back to the Wheeling film, um, which I thought was hilarious. The movie, which was made by some people in Pittsburgh, opened yesterday at the New Amsterdam Theater on 42nd Street and other theaters around town. Um, right, so the New York Times ran this review of the film as an insult, right? Um, they say that the movie was made by some people in Pittsburgh. They don't even say a Ramiro's name or the actor's name. I'm saying, like, who cares? They're just from Pittsburgh. Um, and this is just some little low budget film they made. Um, so again, the sets of how um, these kind of post-industrial aesthetics um, are not only kind of emphasizing uh, local art and the importance of local art, but also this kind of contrast or conversation between um, middle America or the Rust Belt and, and the coast, these kind of places that have a lot of money um, to kind of create this, you know, larger overarching sets of culture. Um, so in that sense, you could think of Night of the Living Dead as kind of like, you know, a punch back. Um, we might not have the money you have, but we can make, you know, damn good films and, you know, iconic famous films and iconic famous art without it, but just some local Pittsburgh people. I think they had maybe $100,000, um, you know, and a director that formerly was just making Iron City beer commercials, right? Um, so to think about this movie as a real kind of triumph of this Rust Belt aesthetics, um, I think is something that's um, human and really emphasizes, emphasizes in his chapter and something that really inspired me on my own art. So I'm going to quickly um, 
finish with the poem I wrote after doing this research. And again, I was thinking a lot about labor and thinking a lot about Rust Belt dialect. Um, I'm from Youngstown, so I don't um, have the Pittsburgh accent, but I do do things like, um, how many of you would say something like, the car needs washed? Does that sound wrong to anyone? Right, the car, it's supposed to be, the car needs to be washed. Right, I have a, right, that sounds wrong, right? I mean, I have a PhD in English, and I didn't know that that was wrong until <laughs> when I was being taught how to teach English in college at Ohio State. My, my professor said, how many of you are from Northeast Ohio? And I was like, he said, you guys come here. He sat us down and said, there's something you guys do when you talk, and you don't know that it's wrong, and you can't say it here because everyone's going to be like, why are you teaching English? And he said, you can't say the car needs washed. The grass needs mowed. Uh, you know, your hair needs washed. That's wrong. Um, so, again, when I was about 24 is when I learned this. Um, and if I'm talking to people, that's still how I talk, right? Um, and it's really nice to be teaching back in this area because my students also, it sounds right to them, so I don't have to worry about it, right? Um, so I wrote this collection. In my collection, the neighborhood girls, where the characters in my book um, talk like how I talk. Again, they are talking in this more academic form of English. Um, so I was thinking about how these, these girls in my book who are you know, striking against uh, their boss, the Dairy Queen um, in the collection, are kind of like these zombies, kind of going on strike against, um, or George Romero's project, which is kind of going on strike against what does it mean to make art on the coast with a lot of money? Um, what can we do with our own culture, our own post-industrial culture, our own Rust Belt culture and dialect, um, and engage with art from that perspective? So I wrote this poem called The Neighborhood Girls Rise Like Man-Eating Zombies. The epigraph is from the Hugh, the Hugh Manon chapter that I've been talking about here. Um, the epigraph is, the zombies' deep-purposed, aimless persistence in the films had a special resonance, resonance in 1970s Pittsburgh. Um, the poem is called a rever reverse avocadarian, which is a poem in which every line starts with a letter of the alphabet. Um, but backwards. So it starts with a Z and goes up to A. If, you're, uh, if there's any poets out here, it's a really fun form to try. Um, so again, you, your first line starts with Z, and then the next line starts with Y, and you go all the way down. Um, I did it this way because it's kind of like the poem rises through the alphabet, like a zombie rising from the dead. Um, and again, this poem, the speaker of this poem is a group of girls in Youngstown, Ohio, um, who work at a Dairy Queen and are really sick of their boss and um, eventually at the end of the collection overthrow their boss. In this poem, they pretend like they're zombies and that they are going to eat their boss. Um, so that's the zombie connection. So again, this is kind of a weird talk in that I kind of presented on someone else's research and how it inspired my own art. Again, I can't um, stress enough how great that Hugh Manon chapter is. I think the library is getting the book in. Um, really reading his narrative um, of his take on zombie films is fascinating and I really encourage it and I thank him for inspiring this poem. So again this is in the, uh, the voice of neighborhood girls working at a Youngstown Dairy Queen. Zero in on our alphabet. You'll find yourself worked up like the sunrise over the rust belt. Expect us where you least expect us. We art too low to stoop. Veering, we gain a foothold, unilateral movement. Together, we stagger like the bald man, staggers at the dive bar, a Cleveland brown shirt taut across his beer belly. Suppose you've seen better backing your daddy's Chevy down the driveway. Rare to meet girls like us, who like men, rare as you. Quit running. Just last week, we took your order at this Dairy Queen. Remember? Pegged you for a comb boy, but watched you down a Sunday. On your, on your left, that woman, blonde enough to stir fury. Nights of reanimation. Mister, did you see her eat that chili dog? Let's just say that something keeps these Rust Belt women hungry. Catch up with your fries. Join us later at the bar. Just past the turnpike, 
Bindi vendor beneath the awning. It's a place to kill an afternoon. Head over and we'll meet you. Go on, don't you trust us? Forget who we are? Employees of the month, dig these work visors, high patriotic. Call us sometime, can we call you baby? Baby, we're hungry for a good time. An American abracadabra. So then they eat their boss and then that's not. Um, all right, so um, that pretty much concludes what I have to say. Um, but I wanted to ask those of you who have seen the film, um, what are your thoughts on it? Or did you ever think about it in terms of like a local film? before this. Does this change how you think about it at all? Yeah. I was a teenager with a boy in the back seat of the car, so. <laughs> so you didn't even remember the film, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I was too scared to think. Great, yeah. What the story would have actually been. I was too scared. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've never been able to watch the whole thing. Yeah. Others, or do you remember the first time you saw it and where you were? Yeah. Uh, comments. Uh, one, it's funny to say when I see the day they release the film, I was in basic training for the police division. So I, and I never saw it until I got out of service and I saw it when I moved back home when I was in Chili Village. That was Bill Park Hill. Yes, yeah, yes, he's in it too. He showed you on his late night horror fiction. Uh -huh. That was the first time I sat. The, the other thing is that um, in those, and I knew you were having trouble, I felt bad that you were having trouble trying kind to of pull those clips up. But in the one you showed, they're in color. Yeah, so yes, it was re remastered, and I couldn't find it in the black and white online to get that clip. But yes, it should be in black and white because it was. Yeah, and it looked kind of bizarre. Yes. I, I think the black and white is, and I just saw it again in a. Uh, we have a little local um, gallery that's opened up uh, called Clientel. And so I love Clientel. Right, you know, he shows how to live again. Uh -huh. And so it was kind of nice to see the big screen and then see the black man and the crowd is just on TV. And, and that was kind of like, well, when I saw that teller there, that kind of like, it almost like took away from it. Yes. You know, like maybe some things work that way, but I don't know about that. And that's another example. He filmed in black and white because it was cheaper, right? So it's another example of how a cost limitation ended up being a, a good ended up being a good choice, a good aesthetic choice, um, which is fascinating. Yeah. One other comment. You say you never saw the film all the way through. Right? Not all the way through. No. <laughs> okay, that's hard for me to believe, especially if you're writing material that's it's kind of. <laughs> I've read a lot about it. Another, another film for you. It was done by a uh, Pittsburgh film student a few years ago. And uh, I read a little five online. It's only about 15, 20 minutes. And it's called Mombies. Mombies. Okay, and it's done in a Pittsburgh cemetery. And it's about these women with baby mothers, little kids. And there's a single woman who doesn't want to be a married woman with kids. And they're all. They're hunting her down with their baby buddies, but it's fantastic. And we'll see the connections to Night of Living Dead. That's so fantastic. I have a one year old, so I'll for sure watch Mombies. That, that's how I feel. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, how, what was the reaction of the rest of the country to this film? You talked about fan base for you in New York, but what about out in beyond New York City? And eventually, I mean, did very well, right? It's one of the most famous cult films of all time. And I think I mentioned it made like something like 250 times the money back that, it's, that it cost for productions. I mean, pretty quickly. Um, and I think, you know, remains one of the most, you know, so it did, it did catch on. Um, and I think critics, it was ahead of its time, right? I think audiences loved it and critics just weren't ready for it or weren't ready for um, taking something low budget in the middle of the country seriously, um, which is why it's so... I mean, just so innovative and so important to think about the ways that art from this part of the country has, you know, revolutionized how we think about things like zombie films, which now we don't think about necessarily as a Rust Belt genre. But in some ways, I mean, it really is. Did Romero make other films? He made a lot of, uh, I think there's six sequels, and I know one was shot in a local mall in Pittsburgh. I think a lot of them were shot locally. Yeah. Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. 
Yeah. Monroeville. Monroeville. Mm. Yeah. So I saw the film for the first time in its entirety before we did the filming of their coming. Yeah. Because I was trying to stay through to Sean's vision. So I had to have the vision in mind that though I am terrified of anything frightening and the thought of any of this was just a little overwhelming even filming. He can tell you I was terrified. And I knew it was fake. Leave me behind, but I was still great. But um, <laughs> as far as the points that you brought up and all of the connections you made, now I'm going to see it differently. And the fact that you tied it into our film as well was very exciting. And it it's it shocked me how now my mind is racing again that I might even watch maybe, but I doubt it, but I'll see parts of it. Um, A lot of it's, it's not really violent. Interesting. It's like now it would take on a whole different meaning to me based on what you have said in this discussion. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and I can, again, can't recommend Manon's article enough if you um, wanted to get the book and read his chapter because he's the one who also, I mean, made me almost watch it, you know, and that's, right. that's a lot. Um, and again, I've seen most of it, but um, especially his um, story about his father's kind of experience of being in the middle of this uh the strike yeah, at the Latro dye company yeah. and thinking about, oh, like thinking about the zombies, not as the enemy, but the zombies as kind of the good guys trying to get right. justice, right? Um, and thinking about how in some ways the, the zombies kind of stand in for like the Rust Belt trying to get justice um, for, you know, what happened in this area right. and, you know, the collapse of industry. Um, and that made the film so much more complex and metaphorical in a fascinating way. Um, that I think, yeah. I have one further question. Yeah. Is there any lineage between Romero's film and these things that have been on TV the last couple of years, like yes. Walking Dead and all that kind of stuff? This I, film's, I can answer, I'm sorry. But it has, it's the most influential horror film of all time. Yes. Everything you see Walking Dead on TV is because of. You agree with that? Absolutely. There's a lot of blood and gore. It's a lot of blood work, it's also what there are a lot of metaphors. Oh, they're watch them. And I just wanted to say before we finish that Bridget is the one who came up with him getting his balloon stuck in the door. Yes. <laughs> that was my favorite. That's my favorite part. That was so funny. Oh, yes, I had a kneel and deer poop in the cemetery. Oh, yes, I had a kneel and deer poop in the cemetery. I didn't realize until I was going into the kneel. I looked down and then I went, I'm going for it. So, so uh, it's I'm amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the book is available. We have the library. And I want to point out that there are a lot of Easter eggs in our movie that are tributes to those two. Uh, by that I mean Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead. We ship from black and white color, for example. That cross you see up there is a replica of what was used in the original film. Um, there's a lot more of them, uh, so I encourage you to watch them again and try to identify them. Because if you watch Night of Living Dead and Dawn, you'll begin to see. Anyway, sorry. But after the time, the pizza and skull theme is in our film, and you mentioned that, and that's a good yes. yes, I don't know if that was from the review, but. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes. But uh, that actress. Did that was, I think, one of the best songs we've ever seen. Yeah. Outstanding. There's going to be a director's cut that will go up. Yes. <laughs> 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 five hours long. It's going to be five hours long. All right. Thank you, Sean. Thank you to the Ohio uh, County Library. Thank you all for being here. Happy Halloween. Um, yeah. Uh, enjoy the film if you haven't watched it yet. Give it, give it a shot. <laughs> and think about the last part. Thank you. Thank you.